If he's not now, may the Lord be with you. Thank you, Pat, for that song this morning. It's Sometimes I am convinced in life we can be so overtaken by what is bad that we forget to see just how good God has been to us. So I invite you to turn with me now to Matthew chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 24 through 30 and then verses 36 through 43. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, then verses 36 through 43. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will collect out of His kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O Christ, give us ears to hear. Ears to hear what you would have us to hear. Hands and feet and bodies, Lord, to do what you would have us to do. Holy God, so we may be the people you call us to be. Speak to us now in our midst, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, shortly after my grandma died, my uncle, who lived with my grandmother, began to make more than a few changes around grandma's house. Now, to be fair, it was his right to do that. He had bought my dad out. He had made some deals with my aunts, and he got the house and chose to live in the house. Most of the changes he made inside were cosmetic. He he painted the walls. uh, He put new carpet on the floors. Uh, replaced some of the old fixtures, a few other things that frankly needed to be done. The thing, I'm surprised it didn't fall in on itself. I didn't care too much, though, about what, what my uncle did on the inside of Grandma's house, though. Really what got me was when he started messing with stuff in the yard, when he started messing with stuff outside. You see, my grandma was proud of her yard. Not so much the grass. There wasn't that much of it. She didn't care about cutting it. Uh, She wasn't really all that concerned with the pecan and catawba trees that lined the little short gravel driveway. No, what grandma was proud of was her flower bed. It was just there, a little short one in the front yard, curled around to the side. Even though you couldn't see the side of the house, she still took care of that. I spent many spring and and summer afternoons walking with Grandma in the front yard talking about stuff and and looking at those flowers. Grandma was almost always barefoot. It was South Alabama. 
She would tell me as we walked what each of the flowers would called when they would bloom. There were bright orange spotted tiger lilies, long wispy red spider lilies, a sprawling red thorn bu- or a thorny red rose bush that somebody had given her because of her name. My grandmother's name was Rose. Everyone called her Rose. She had angel trumpets. On the side of the house were these giant, I think six foot tall, giant blue hydrangeas. And then anchoring it all, right there in the corner, seemingly tethering the house to the very earth itself, was an enormous camellia tree with its thick petaled pink flowers and buds that fit just right into a slingshot pouch. (laughs) Grandma loved those flowers, and so did I. I came home from college one weekend after Grandma had died to find that my uncle had cut them all down. He had taken a weed whacker to the lilies. He had pulled up the rose bushes and hydrangeas and then took a chainsaw to that stately camellia to where it was just a four-foot stick in the yard. What was more, I found that he had taken a, a a whole pump sprayer of Roundup and had gone over the whole flower bed to make sure he had killed it all. When I asked him why he did it, I said, what are you doing? This, this is Grandma's flower bed. Why did you do it? Why did you, why did you destroy this? It just made flowers a few months ago. It had been making flowers forever. Why? He said, Christopher, now let me say something. If you call me Christopher, I do not like it. Okay. Only one person I let do that now is Grandma. And she's gone now. Um, but my family tends to call me that, and he said, Christopher, the flower bed has been eat up with weeds for years. Y'all know what eat up means, right? We're all from Been eat up with weeds for years. There were vines growing up the side of the house. It pulled down some of the shutters off the windows. There was crabgrass all in the flower bed. I even think when I was running over everything with the mower that I think I saw some poison ivy. It was just easier. It was easier to cut and kill it all than a fool with trying to fix it than try to pull the weeds out and get the flowers to grow. He told me your grandma never tried to pull the weeds out or keep the grass from growing in the flower bed, so it just got eat up with weeds after all these years. But it's funny. I never noticed the weeds. I suppose, I suppose that comes with age, with experience, with the ebb and flow of seasons. The longer one lives, the more one notices the weeds. I suppose one begins to notice the weeds when you grow bored with the beauty of the flowers, when you take for granted the seasonal blooms, the regular fragrance they provide. You know, it seems to me that we are sort of living in an age where a lot more folks notice the weeds. You turn on the television, another homicide, another murder, another unarmed black man shot by a white police officer, an unarmed white woman shot by a Muslim police officer. You hear stories about politicians possibly colluding with foreign governments or other politicians possibly hiding emails on private servers. You open the newspaper, more weeds, another bombing, another story about some senseless lawsuit between city councilmen, another letter to the editor talking about the writer's hatred for this or that issue, more weeds, weeds everywhere. We're bombarded with images and posts on social media of how the world's just one step away from going straight to hell. Just one step away, and it's all over. We hear about how it's getting bad, so you better buy gold and guns and ammo and and doomsday buckets filled with potato soup and bread from people like Jim Baker. Yeah, that Jim Baker is selling five-gallon buckets of potato soup for you to put in your basement for when the Lord comes. We hear about how the very fabric of humanity is coming unwound. And here's the sad truth. So many of us believe it. We believe it. We look out and we don't see the flowers anymore. 
We don't see the wheat growing in the field. We only see the weeds. I suppose it'd be easy to point my finger at the media. That seems to be the, the hip thing to do. Point my finger at the media, say it's all their fault. It's their fault. They're always showing us bad news. Can't watch TV at night. It's always bad news. But can I tell you something, friends? They wouldn't put it on there if we didn't want to see it. If it didn't make them money. I'm afraid we're like the workers in Jesus' parable. There's wheat, there's, there's fruit, flowers growing all around us. And yet so many of us, all we can see are the weeds. God is so good all around us. And all we can see is how bad everybody else is. We see the weeds growing in the world and we give them our time and attention in the media. But what's even worse, I think, is that we strive, we seem to strive to see the weeds in each other. Don't we? I mean, it's awful to think that there are those who give of themselves, who take the risk, who put themselves out there to try to make a difference in the world. And what do we do? I do it. Maybe you don't. I see their flaws. Their sins. Oh, well, you know, she's really one of these people. He's really just doing it for the money, for show. We see the weeds. We accuse others of not living up to the standards of what it takes to be worthy of growing in God's garden. Or we judge an entire group of people. You know, the rare exception of someone who burns up the media, who burns up time on the television, or takes up all the ink on the page. It's what we do. It's what we've always done as people. We can't seem to take our eyes off the weeds. I'm beginning to think that this parable before us is Jesus' way of, of showing us our obsession, of peeling back the layers to reveal to us our needless concern for the weeds of this world when we've been called to grow ourselves as wheat to grow as God's harvest, to notice the good things that God is doing and growing in our very midst. To tell the truth, I, I, there are a lot of things in this world I don't know. As I've said to some of you, uh, if, I, if you're around when I die, make sure that's on my headstone. Here lies Chris. He didn't know. A lot of things I don't know. I'm not entirely sure why I and so many of us are so obsessed with pulling the weeds of this world. While we're so overcome with the thought that it's somehow up to us, we've got to be the ones walking along in the field, pointing out the weeds to the God and everybody else. I'm not sure why that's us. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it's just easier to pull weeds than to try to grow wheat. Maybe it's easier to just tell the master about all the bad things we see and hear than to get our hands dirty in trying to cultivate goodness in the world. Can I tell you something? I think it's easier to do that. I think it's a lot easier. I know it's a lot easier. Seriously, it's a whole lot easier for me to see someone as a criminal. They broke the law, throw them in jail. It's a lot easier to see someone that way than to see them as some son of some mother who's had a horrible life of bad influence and unavoidable consequences and wonder, how? How can I help? It's easier to call them for weeds. Really, it's a lot easier for me to ignore the beggar on the side of the road than to ask, how did he get there? Did I have anything to do with it? How can I get involved in making that person's life a lot better? It's a lot easier to pull the weeds than to try to grow the wheat. And I suppose when it gets right down to it, it's a lot easier to pull the things that seem to just happen naturally than to try to grow something out of the dirt of this world. Maybe that's why we give in so easily to looking out for the weeds while we miss the wheat. I mean, then the, the parable, Jesus says that the wheat came up and produced, and almost as an aside, and also the weeds came up. 
but the workers focus on the weeds. Maybe. Maybe it's us. So easily distracted by bad news and so quick to brush off good news as, as an exception. As puff piece journalism. Maybe. Maybe that's why so many Christians, at least in America, are so easily caught up in the notion that the world's going to end soon. Which, by the way, every generation, somebody stands up, right, and says, the world is going to end in my lifetime. Every generation, somebody has said that. Do you know how many of them got it right? Just think about it for a minute and get back to me. <laughs> Maybe that's why so many Christians want to believe that the world is getting worse. I love the story that, that Tony Campolo tells about when he was a child, sitting on the pew with his mother during a revival. And the preacher's going on and on about how awful the world is, how bad the world's getting. How awful, and everybody's saying amen. And he looks at his mother and goes, why is everybody so happy? And she said, oh, baby, if the world gets too bad, Jesus will come back. As if Jesus didn't tell us to make the world better. Maybe that's why we like to think the world's getting worse. That the weeds are taking over and that the master is coming to send his angels to pull all the weeds up by the root and throw them into hell now. But did you notice? Did you notice? Nowhere in that parable, nowhere, does it say that the weeds overtake the wheat. Nowhere in that parable does it say, oh, well, the whole field is lost. We can see a few sprigs of wheat among all the weeds. Nowhere does it say that. Not once does Jesus say that the weeds in this eschatological end-of-the-age field are taken over by these unruly weeds. The weeds are there, yeah, they're there. But so is the wheat. The bad is there, but God is good. And the wheat, it ain't just a handful. It's enough to harvest and store in the barn. The wheat isn't hidden among the weeds. It's clearly there in abundance. So why are we so obsessed with the weeds? What if every one of us, I don't know how many of us are in this room, let's say 200 folks. What if every one of us in this room this morning decided right now before we left to give our attention to the good that God is doing in the world to the wheat rather than the weeds? What if every one of us decided right now to give our attention to the good things that are happening in and around us than always trying to find what's wrong and what's bad in the world? What if we chose to see the good in each other and all of God's people rather than trying to find out what's the worst. Harry Chapin put it this way uh, in, in sort of the, t the titular song, of, or sort of the, the ultimate song in his musical, The Cotton Patch Gospels. He says, uh, if a man tried to take his time on earth to prove before he died what one man's life could be worth, I wonder what would happen to this world. What would happen? If instead of always trying to find the bad, we always looked for the good that God is doing, what would happen? I'll tell you what, I'll start. I'll go first. I'll tell you about the wheat that's growing among the weeds everyone else is trying to tell us about. You see, it's so easy to believe that things are so bad that the world is overrun with weeds when that's all you're ever told. And that makes it hard to believe that the world is actually, I want you to get this, the world is actually getting better. It's true. In the last 30 years, the number of people in this world living in extreme poverty, that's somebody living on less than $1.25 a day, that number in the last 30 years has went down from 53% of the world's population to 17%. That's huge. That's not a coincidence. That's something that Matthew might call the kingdom of heaven. 
I bet the weeds have also distracted us from knowing that child labor, especially child labor in extremely hazardous conditions in this world, in the last 16 years, has been cut in half. That's an extremely important thing. Something you probably don't know because they don't talk about it. They all want you to see the weeds. It means that more children in this world have a chance to be children, to go to school, to live longer, fuller lives. I mean, look at the wheat that's growing in the field. Did you know that infant mortality under the age of five, children who once died under the age of five, that's been cut in half in the last 25 years. 50% children are able to live. It's the result of better medical practices, greater access to prenatal and maternal care for mothers. It's the result of women finally being treated like human beings in parts of the world where they once weren't. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm telling you. I'm not some pie-in-the-sky optimist. I'm not trying to tell you that there's nothing wrong in the world just because a few things have gotten better. But I think it's extremely important for those of us who call ourselves Christians not to get swept up in the lie that everything is horrible, that there are forces in the world that are trying to make your life worse, to not get swept up in that cognitive dissonance of telling everybody that the world is on fire while living lives that kings centuries ago would have been envious of. That's a perceived reality that's caused by a very narrow vision of God's kingdom. It's that sort of thinking that leads us to believe things that are just not true. We start thinking that the weeds are taking over. It's that sort of thinking that causes us to believe that more people than ever are out there to get us, to hurt us. But the truth is, things like violent crime have consistently been declining in this country for the last 50 years. Where once uh, about 50 out of every thousand people experienced some act of violent crime, now it's about 15 out of every thousand. When we only look for the weed, we tend to see a rash of teenage pregnancy to look out and make judgments about these girls with swollen bellies. But the truth is, teen pregnancy is at an all-time low, which means that more girls are finishing high school, going to college, joining the workforce or the military, contributing to society in ways that may not have been able to do just a generation ago. We've been shown the weeds, but folks, the wheat is growing. And while there are those who try to tell us that the sky is falling and the weeds are taking over the field, people are more educated now than they've ever been. People have more access to clean water than they've ever had. More people in the world can read now than they've ever been able to. More girls have access to education now than ever. Diseases that once meant certain death are easily treated, vaccinated, or have been wiped off the face of the earth, saving countless lives that would have otherwise been lost. And while we may give in to the notion that the world is a more violent and war-torn place now than ever, the truth is that deaths caused by war and conflict are the lowest they've been in a century. The weeds, folks, don't stand a chance. The wheat of God's kingdom is growing. Are there troubles in this world? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are we called to simply point them out and go, well, we'll just wait for the Lord to come back? No. We are called to make a difference. To strive to bring about justice and peace in this world. But if we allow ourselves to only see the weeds, to give in to the notion that everything is awful and there's no hope left for the world, if we believe that all there is is bad news, then why in the world? that we even try to preach something called good news. What does it say when all we see are the weeds and proclaim bad news? What does it say about the gospel we believe and the God that we worship? I want to challenge you. I really want you to think. I want to challenge you today to begin to look for the wheat growing in God's field. 
to take time to recognize the flowers blooming in God's garden, to not be overtaken by what the evil one sows in this world. Don't give all your energy to trying to pull weeds. Remember, it's not your field in the first place. It's God's. And God has called you to grow and to cultivate the good you see around you and throughout the world. So stop looking for the weeds. They're there. But so is the wheat. So are the good things that God is doing. And we are called to recognize them, to celebrate them, to help them grow. And in so doing, find out that we ourselves are growing more and more into the fruit God desires us to be. Look for the wheat. Look for the good. And stop getting hung up on the bad. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we confess to you this morning that there are times, times, Lord, when we may be distracted in this world by the presence of bad news, of weeds growing in your field. But, Lord, remind us that we have the good news, the good news of your great love for us, the good news of your life, death, and resurrection for us. The good news, Lord, that this world is not lost because it is yours. So God, help us. Help us, Lord, to not be so caught up in trying to pull weeds. Give us the strength and the determination, the long-suffering and courage, Lord, to help the weak grow cultivate goodness and kindness, compassion and love in this world. That when that day does come, when you send your reapers out into the field, that the weeds will be few and the harvest, or the harvest will be plentiful. So Holy Spirit, move now. Help us to confess to you, to rid ourselves and our lives the desire, Lord, to be selfish, to cling, Lord, to those things that we are sold as bad news. To give them up to you now, that we may leave from this place as those who look for the wheat among the weeds, and the good in this world. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray now in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.